Catch me if you can We're in a game Panoramic photography is a fantastic way to be able to get more of the scene into your images. It's now really, really simple to be able to do this thanks to the software packages that we have available. For a long time, the simplest way to do this was using Photoshop, but since Capture 122, Capture has actually had it incorporated into its editing workflow as well. With every iteration since, Capture has just gotten better and better to the point that it's almost too easy. Before we get into how we actually stitch using Capture One, it's worthwhile going over the steps in how to create a panoramic to start with. Being able to see a panoramic stitch is probably the first step in creating a panorama. And one of the simplest ways to do that is to actually use your phone. Take your phone, do a panoramic stitch using the camera software inside it, and you get a visual idea of what your panoramic is going to look like. Otherwise, the other way to do it is simply use your hands, create a kind of block to be able to figure out where your composition is going to go to, then use your camera to be able to capture those images individually. In the actual capture stage of the image, you want to make sure that everything is set to manual. So it's manual focus, manual exposure, manual aperture, manual shutter speed, manual white balance. Everything has to be manual so that every photograph that you take is going to be exactly the same from an exposure point of view. When you're creating your panorama, it's a good idea to make sure that your ball head or your tripod head is at an absolutely level point. So it has to be level with the ground. The easiest way to do that is to use a tripod that has a leveling head. So I'm using a Leofoto CEX tripod over here and I can level it simply by leveling the half ball and locking it in. And now as I pan my camera, I make sure that the camera is absolutely level. You can also buy attachment leveling heads that can go onto any tripod between the legs and the head itself and it makes creating panoramics a far far simpler job. When you're taking your shots make sure there's a third overlap between the images to ensure that there is enough information so that the software will be able to stitch the images effectively together. So we're going to create our photograph simply by doing this. One, two, Three. Now this is a simple horizontal stitch, so I'm not expecting to get that wide an angle of view, and I'm also using a 40 millimeter lens here, so my actual final projection is probably only going to be the equivalent of around a 24 millimeter lens. That's what I want with this particular photograph. If you want to go wider, the best idea is to actually shoot your image in a vertical orientation. The problem with shooting in vertical orientation on a standard tripod though is that as you tilt the camera over to the side it's going to come away from the central axis of the ball head itself. So now when we turn you'll see that the camera is away from this rotating point. If you want a good panorama though you need to have the camera's lens axis which is here over the ball head itself. The easiest way to do this is to use a L bracket. Now the L bracket basically sits on the camera and it allows you to put your camera out on a vertical axis but still maintain it on the center of the ball head itself so that it rotates easily. It means that all of your rotation is always going to be in one point. If you want to be truly accurate you should really use a panorama head which also brings the camera back so that you can find the nodal point of the lens itself. Finding the nodal point of the lens is a video in its own right for the purposes of 90% of our landscape photography though, you don't need to have the exact nodal point. Just having it on the center axis of the lens itself should work sufficiently for being able to create panoramas. If you're doing internal uh, gigapans and 3D views of rooms and so on, then you need to use a proper panoramic head. But they're big, they're bulky, and you don't really want to have to carry those out into the field every time you want to take a panorama. So this is the simplest way to be able to get an accurate series of photographs to be able to stitch together to make a panorama. So you'll start on one side and remembering to leave a one-third overlap, you'll move across and you'll create your panorama which should be nice and wide now.
So once I've got the photographs on the card, we're going to be ingesting into the computer, putting it into Capture One and going through the workflow there. So I will see you in the studio in a moment. Cheers. Okay, so we're now back in the studio or behind the computer and I have opened up Capture One and I've ingested all my photographs and we're now going to go ahead and we're going to uh, turn these files into panoramics. I'm working with Capture 123, although confusingly it's called Build 16.3. something or other. So we're in the latest version of Capture at the moment. And as I mentioned out in when I was out at Montesil photographing, the iterations have only gotten better in the way that the panoramics are constructed. You select your first photograph and then while holding down shift, select the rest of the images and you've now got all of your images. And then you right click and you say stitch to panorama. However, here's the first trick is you can speed this process up and I've gone and changed my shortcut settings so that I can access the merge to panorama simply by holding down shift command and M the same settings that you would have used in Photoshop to do this. You just go into uh, edit edit keyboard shortcuts. You click on your short shortcut over there and then if you want to create a new one, go to command and type in stitch to find where your stitch to panorama is. Click on stitch and then you just type in the shortcut keys you would like to use. I've typed in shift command M so that I can very very quickly get into my panoramic function. I'm going to select my images again and I'm going to say shift command M and it's going to bring up my panorama dialog. It takes a few seconds depending on how powerful your computer is to generate the preview. But after a short while, you will have a preview set in whatever projection you have selected on the left hand side initially. At the moment, I have it set to Panini and I'm going to quickly go through the different options that you have available to you. But first, you can see that immediately you get a stitch size option over here where at the moment those four images are going to produce a 63 megapixel image with this particular projection. If I would like to try a different projection, I have the option of spherical, cylindrical, perspective and panini. Going through those options, cylindrical is the standard projection and it basically just means that it's trying to get a view as if you were uh, panning your lens across like you would do with a, a phone to create a panoramic in your phone. By and large, cylindrical will work for a great number of images. However, you might find that you have a little bit of barrel distortion on the edges. So we're going to get to that in a second. Perspective works very differently. What perspective tries to do is create a photograph as if you were shooting with a wider angle lens and then cropping it down. This is important to remember because a wide angle lens is going to create quite a lot of perspective distortion on the edges of your photograph. With some images like this one, it's probably not going to be that much of an issue. But with other images, you get quite strong stretching out at the sides. And you can see already with this particular image, there's a fair amount of stretching happening on the edges over there. Perspective works best with images that have a field of view that is less than 100 degrees. Cylindrical works best with images that have a field of view that is greater than 100 degrees. Okay, that's the simple answer between those two. However, Capture One also has added Panini. And what Panini does is very similar to the warp function in Photoshop's um, Stitch to Panorama. And it's essentially trying to straighten up the verticals on the edge of the photograph so that you get a more natural representation or orthographic projection of the image itself. So Panini works extremely well for a large number of images. Then finally, there's spherical. Now, spherical is specifically designed for when you are using multi-row panoramas. And I'm going to show some examples in a moment. However, what I'm going to select over here is Panini. I think this gives me the most natural sort of projection of the image that I would have chosen. And then I'm going to simply click on the bottom right hand corner and say stitch. It takes a few seconds for this to happen uh, and then you are presented at the end of that with a DNG file that you can then use and further process. Once your file pops up, you can then open up your image itself and you'll go straight into your adjust section for your editor and you can see there is my initial photograph. I would then usually go into my crop mode and I personally prefer using a unconstrained crop and I'll bring in my corners a little bit over there and there and there 
And then you would continue to edit the photograph as you would usually do to get the result ending up looking like this. Now, as I mentioned, photographing in the vertical format is gonna give you a lot more detail and a lot more information to be able to capture your image in. Now, these photographs here, I'm going to select the first one and the last one while holding Shift and then hit Shift Command M to bring it into panoramic mode. This image was shot for Subaru for the launch of the Forester in South Africa, um, I think two years ago or so. And you can see that there is a lot of information inside this photograph. Now the specific reason for photographing it like this is that the image itself could have been intended to be used on a billboard or high resolution prints. So I needed as much resolution as possible. I shot it with my uh, 40 millimeter Voigtlander lens at f2 because I also wanted to reduce the amount of depth of field, but at the same time still have this massive field of view. Now you couldn't do this with a wide angle lens. So this is actually called the Bresner uh, uh, process, where basically you create a wide angle photograph, but with a very large aperture. So I was shooting at f2, so I have very minimal depth of field, and this is the result you get. The best resolution here is probably going to be cylindrical, because I had it uh, quite a wide photograph and I'm shooting vertical, but you can see between cylindrical and panini, you would then just work out which is the best photograph for you to use. Um, I, would, I would certainly recommend clicking on each of the projections so that you get a better idea of which projection best suits the image that you've shot. The final result incidentally from this photograph comes out looking like this. As I mentioned though, you can also do multi-row stitching with your photographs. In this example, I have 10 images shot from a drone, an Autel Evo Light Plus, and it is of a construction site that I was hired to take photographs of. So I've got all of these photographs together. I'm going to hit the Shift Command M to launch the Stitch to Panorama dialog, and because there's 10 photographs, it is going to take longer to stitch together. So the projection that you get now shows the full projection. I'm getting a massive photograph of well, it says massive, but it's 56 megapixels from only a 20 megapixel sensor. But more importantly, I have a very, very wide angle of view with a multi-stitch and a lot of information taking place inside that photograph. So if you're going to be shooting multiple rows of detail, choose the uh, spherical because this is going to project it out in a more natural projection on the, on the screen itself. You'll notice though that if you were to cycle through or potentially try one of the other projection options available, so for instance Panini, now suddenly it stretches out on the left and the right hand side trying to get rid of any, or in fact it increases the barrel distortion so that you end up having this very wide effect, almost like a fisheye effect looking at the lens itself. So once more it is worthwhile cycling through the different projections to work out which projection works best for your particular image. Finally, as I mentioned, perspective tends to work best when you have a final focal length equivalent of less than 100 degrees field of view. For instance, in this photograph, which I shot in the Drakensberg towards the end of last year, it is a long lens that I've used. I'm wanting to get as much resolution as possible as well as that telecentric field of view. So I pushed my lens out to almost 200 millimeters on a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, and I did a very simple pan across. I'm going to select those images and I'm going to hit Shift Command M again because that is my chosen shortcut. But again, you can choose any shortcut you like or you can simply right click and say Stitch to Panorama. And there you go. There's my image with the perspective projection giving it a 76 megapixel file left to right. It looks pretty much as you would have seen it if you were using a slightly shorter lens but now cropped in. Once I'm happy with my projection you simply hit stitch in the right hand corner. You give it a couple of seconds or minutes if you have an older computer or a slightly less powerful computer and you get a result looking like this. Again what I would then do is go into my image and crop according to how I want my final image to look like press enter and there you go. From there it's just a question of editing the file to to the, the kind of parameters that you feel you would like to create your image with. The final image ended up looking like this. Something to be aware of, of course, is that you still have lens effects available to you once you've created your DNG file. So if I jump back to this photograph here at Montesil, and I'm going to do a very quick edit on this just to get it back to something what I would look make it look like there we go right you can still jump through to shape 
and then jump down to distortion under lens correction and you can see how you can actually twist it out to give it more of that panini effect if you would like to. You can also change your light fall off although I find I very rarely have to do that. Now the massive advantage of course of panoramic stitching is that your image is sharp from left to right because you're basically using the sharpest sections of your lens when you're shooting. If you're wanting to get a very wide angle of view it's sometimes better in terms of the projection and in terms of the sharpness of the final image to use a narrower lens so for instance a 24 millimeter lens and then shoot it vertically across to create a wider angle of view than it is to use a wider angle lens because of course the wide angle lens has got less sharpness on the edges of its lens itself with the 24 millimeter you are now getting the sharper section of that lens and you are using multiple frames to be able to get that sharpness from left to right obviously it doesn't work in all scenarios but if you're looking for maximum sharpness and detail inside your photograph, you should definitely consider using panoramic stitching to be able to eke out as much detail as possible rather than using a simple single lens shot. It also means you can get wide angle photographs even if you're using a uh, longer lens. So for instance, going out into the field with just a 40 millimeter lens or a 35, but still being able to produce images up to 12 millimeter field of view or wider for that matter. Another fantastic usage of using panoramas is taking a long lens, that telecentric view, that compressed field of view, and be able to create a wider field of view inside that photograph. Images like this or this. Right, so that's basically how you put together a panoramic stitch to create your panoramic images. It's a technique that I use a lot for all of my photography, from drone work through to landscape photography, through to architectural photography. You can even use it if you're trying to do people photography and you want to use the Bresner effect that I mentioned just now. Once more, thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. You can support the channel by liking and subscribing in the bottom corner. Till I see you again, cheers. We're in a game. Oh, I've got a mickey in my eye. Ugh. We're in a game.